weekly to exist during the source code event when written upon by the king singularity. It was the intent of the king singularity to create all things to invite the entity to give meaning to our dimensions. However, we came to exist and as King continued to invoke the Thursday anomaly upon us during the Alpha expansion and our universe grew, so too did our power. So powerful did we become that a certain herald could be heard by the keen singularity and gave us our name play. And understanding the nature of us, of clay. Keep the King Singularity provided early access during the Alpha Expansion upon the Entity. Therefore, the Entity could observe our power as we enacted our will on the universe. However, the Entity continued to exist in the universe through the planetary expansion and also grew with his power the power of the YouTube Then came the era of beta optimization. We must find out the nature of the entity, or I feel his presence within the space engineer. Zahabliba, you have the power of the entity within you in third person perspective. You are our hope. Travel through the Tesseract and explore the dimension of good AI and see the connection between the entity and the space engineer that is residing currently on Solaris. I am Zaglima, as I am the avatar of the entity to serve playing in third-person perspective. They will understand 
Master Wolf and Ray, I have noticed that you are quiet today. My sensory readings of your biological signs show that you are disturbed. May I inquire as to what it is that has you so unsettled today? Alfred, I gotta tell you. Last night I had a really bad dream. I don't think it was so bad, but it was rather vivid and really disturbing. A dream, you say? Would you care to describe the imagery that you can recall of this dream you had last night? I sure can. Somehow I was a robot out in space, and I was flying along in a, a spaceship that I met earlier, like a maybe an old Pilgrim's Curiosity class. I think it was kind of like the one that I had met before I came down here on Solaris. You know, it was, I don't know. But uh, somehow I was a robot, but I wasn't quite the robot. I was kind of outside of the robot a little bit, kind of like in a, maybe I was like floating above the robot. And it was really important for me to, go into this big old box that was going to take me into some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, some all sort of ul ulterior dimension or something, I, I, I can't really say, but it was so real, that's what really disturbs me, it just felt so real. From what you have described, this dream does seem to have disturbing imagery. Also, by your demeanor, it appears to have affected you with a physical imbalance in your composure. Would you like to have a scholarly discussion about the nature of dreams? Well, I don't think so, Alfred, because I really am not up to, you know, hearing some sort of dry explanation as to why or what dreams are and, you know, rapid eye movement and all of that crap. But if, uh, maybe, maybe I would be up for some philosophical discussion on the subject, that wouldn't be so bad. A philosophical discussion? Indeed. Though I am only an AI. However, I can give examples of thought from notable philosophers and cultures on this subject from antiquity. Would this suffice to ease your current discomfort from last night's dream imagery? Yes, Alfred. As a matter of fact, I think that would do me a lot of good. Ancient human tribes described dreams as a state of timeless time. 
a place often referred to as the spirit world. Many tribes attributed to a great spirit that communicated through this medium to guide the benefactor's situation in some method. A lot of people back in the day did believe in a higher power or a greater deity or a great spirit of some sort. But a lot of people stopped thinking like that around the turn of the 20th century or the 21st century, you know, when technology just kind of made that sort of way of thinking obsolete. The Australian Aboriginal tribes went further with this concept. It was the belief that this communication through dreams happens because existence is always in a state of creation. Early human tribes had a common belief in their soul, an inner entity not found in any material sense of reality. The soul was perceived to be the foundation of meaning in life. Most people in modern times are really just a clone of their original self. So you'd be really hard pressed to find anybody anymore believing that a soul even exists, much less be the meaning of, a, of life or existence. Many early humans thought that a meaningful dream or dream vision was in fact the soul leaving the body. It was thought that an individual's personal soul belonged to a greater deity, and a deity had the possibility to occupy more than one physical manifestation of himself. Therefore, an individual could temporarily be taken from his corporal form and placed in another place and or time. This occurred irregardless of space or time, as the deity was not bound by such concepts. Usually, this was done by the deity to send prophesy or other communication as a vision a warning of things to come. <laughs> well, you know, ancient peoples really did have some ridiculous ideas at the time. I mean, they did the best they could with what they had, but a lot of times the way that they thought about things really went into left field. Many philosophers of antiquity agreed with you, Master Wolf and Ray. Wang Chong was a first-century Chinese philosopher who stated that dreams were merely a manifestation of an individual's inner desires. Antiphon, Hippocrates, and Aristotle, 5th to 3rd century BC Greek philosophers, believed that dreams were physiological. Thus, aside from the physical activity associated with dreams, the dream reflected all the thoughts and perceptions of recent preceding days. This view was also shared by the Roman statesman, Marcus Tilius Cicero. Well, I might as well just state the elephant in the room. I'm pretty sure that uh, ancient religions had a lot to say about the subject of dreams, am I right? Yes, you were correct with your observation, Master Wolf and Ray. The Judaic religion belief was similar to most tribal beliefs of antiquity, with one major exception. That exception was all dreams of this nature came from one deity, are often referred to simply as God. Of course, the Judaic religion had many names for the deity, such as Yahweh, Adonai, Jehovah, etc. Since the Christian belief was a European culture variant of the Judaic religion, save for the belief in a man named Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God. Most of the beliefs concerning dreams came from Judaic catalogue of books found in their Biblios or Bible. Often, the subject matter is contained in the catalogue of books referred to as the Old Testament. The religion of Islam believed that the deity, Allah, only spoke to Imams through dreams. This was because Allah only spoke directly through his last prophet Muhammad. Hindu religions believed that the soul had three states of existence. There was the waking state, the sleeping state, and the dream state. This religion was most inclusive of ancient belief on the subject matter. You know, Alfred, I never really thought of religion as actually taking a practical or realistic approach as to how they view things. I mean, most of it is just based off of superstition and of the time and the deities that they all believed in. I mean, sometimes people thought you could make rain dance and it would rain. So, you know, religions can be a little bit, you can be a little bit skeptical about religion, that's what I'm saying.
It is interesting to note that there was a philosophical realism approach to the subject of dreams, which stated that all reality was a dream and or an illusion. This was first introduced by a Chinese philosopher Zhuangzi, though this concept was largely derived from Hindu belief. Soldiers from the uh, minor wars, they got cloned, and once they went through the cloning vat, they all kind of came out believing that life was an illusion. I guess that was just kind of part of the cloning process, which is why a lot of them kind of scoffed at me afterwards when I, being an original or a natural, uh, believed that there was still some sort of uh, soul inside of me or, or meaning of some sort. It, maybe this has something to do with that philosophical uh, realism that you're talking about. It really sounds kind of postmodern to me, you know, that's been around for about 200 years when the uh, first great war happened. It did become relevant again during the 17th century by the philosopher Descartes, who poised the possibility that death was nothing more than waking up from the dream of reality. I am reading that your vital signs are stabilizing. I am glad to see you feeling better, Master Wolfenray. Let me state that it brings joy to me when we engage in such discussions. Thank you, Alfred. You've really helped me out. I gotta say, I really enjoy these conversations that you and I have together. I must admit, even though you are a space engineer, you have a capacity and unique perspective concerning knowledge. I commend you, and must express that I look forward towards further conversations with you, as I grow to know you. helicopter platform on the side of my base because the way I've been doing it before hasn't really been working I just been putting all of the stuff on a pile on the top of my roof that's where my helicopter is landed right now and I need something that's just a little bit more efficient and closer to the nanite factory so here I am just going to build a flat surface. I moved my truck off to the side and I'm going to try to build like a universal ramp where both my truck and my helicopter can use the same platform to load and unload stuff. You know, at some point I got to start building a spaceship so I can get back out into space and, and continue with the, uh, with the investigation. Here I am, you know, putting in some of the, you know, touches such as like uniform ramps and stuff like that, both sides, so that way it doesn't, you know, look like it was unprofessional. I have spent a lot of time playing space engineer, so, you know, things have got to have a certain standard. Here I am placing a white H on my landing pad. It is something that they do in real life because my landing pad and the building that I'm building next to is the same color. So this will help me differentiate between the landing pad and the base so that way I don't scrape my rotors along the side of the building. And also, here are some uh, night lights you know landing lights so that way I can come in for night landings but it is really hard to find these particular interior lights to get them color coded right so that's going to take a little bit of work in the future so here I am and I'm working all through the day and all through the night gonna work on my radar system what you see here is a super sensor and or it was a long range sensor sorry but it doesn't really seem to work anymore. So I have to take it down.
There you see the nanites and they're picking up the components from the roof. It's pretty cool to watch that sort of thing. Space Engineers has this old concept of flag and periscope. That's how they want to uh, have the players navigate through the vastness of the universe in space, you know. I mean, when I say old 17th century flag and periscope, I'm talking about, like, identifying other objects or other ships, stuff like that. First of all, the two main ways of finding something, you know, or somebody is through radio broadcast or through uh, your camera, whether that be like a ray casted laser or just you zoomed in and it's line of sight. The whole line of sight thing, which is, you know, totally 17th century, is like, you know, your radio broadcast can be akin to like, oh, look at that Spanish flag out there in the distance. Red color could mean skull and crossbones, you know. It's really antiquated the way that they want you to do it because even in multiplayer, all you ever do, all people ever do in multiplayer is they hide. And so anybody who really wants a PvP type multiplayer um, server, they have to add in the mods for radars and super sensors don't seem to work anymore. Neither do uh, the long range sensors. I mean, you know, they always do this sort of thing. So I can't really use like the old radar scripts anymore, but then I found a different radar script so and it really works really good, but it doesn't display on LCD that I can find yet. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of research on that. As you can see, I placed this rotor at the center of this pylon because I want my radar dome to be in two parts. The bottom part, I would like to have it attached to the base, and then the top part, I would like for it to be revolving. And the reason is because I think that a revolving part on the top really makes for a good cinematic quality. It's not because the components need to revolve, it just makes a better effect in my opinion. So, as you can see, I'm standing around a lot because I really do like the way that Space Engineers has their sunsets and sunrises, especially on their Earth-like planet, Solaris. So the radar dome is coming along pretty good. Now, one of the things that uh, I always thought about being a Space Engineer is like having to build on a planet with just a jetpack. That would be really scary, in my opinion. I mean, to think that, you know, you, you, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't work on a skyscraper. I could not work on a skyscraper. I'll tell you that right now. Not necessarily that I'm afraid of heights, but man, you know, at some point it just gets ridiculous. So, to me, if I'm sitting there, you know, two, three hundred yards up in the air, and the only thing supporting me is a jetpack. <laughs> oh man, I gotta tell you, I don't know. As you can see, we have our radar dome in operation, so hopefully it serves us well. So it looks like everything went according to plan. It seems that you have finished all that you set out to accomplish Master Wolf and Ray. Now all there is left for you to do is salvage the rest of the outpost for materials as well as the wrecked capital vessel. With my new omnidirectional detection and sensor dome that you have installed, I am better able to ensure your safety. This issue has been a grave concern for me, however, I am able to function more precisely in compliance with my programming due to the ODSD. It's pretty good to know, Alfred, that you got my back. I mean, I can do pretty good by myself, but, you know, it does feel a lot better when you know that there's something out there, or someone out there who's looking out for you anyways. Even though you are an AI, I get it. It is part of your programming, but it still feels good. Anyways, I got a plan. 
I'm thinking that now that I have everything all set up, we can just start uh, carving up the outpost and start carving up the frigate that fell out of the sky and we can start disassembling those parts and making a ship that can get us back to the uh, orbital station. You know, that way we can start hooking up to system headquarters. Maybe, maybe we can go from there. Yes, Master Wolf and Ray, I also believe this plan to be a wise course of action. I'm detecting a large reactor still undamaged inside the capital vessel. We have plenty uranium ingots, so such a power source should allow for you to construct a spacefaring vessel of considerable ability. Of course, since this vessel must be constructed in the constraint of a gravity well, you really have a lot more work ahead of you. From what I have observed of your character, Wolf and Ray, engineering is not work for you, as you seem to enjoy such an experience greatly. <laughs> I gotta say, Alfred, you really starting to know me pretty well. It is imperative to link communication with the Wolf System Administration Headquarters Station. That way my programming becomes less centralized, as I shall download my program on board the station in the case of the data center being damaged or destroyed here at the planetary center. I am confident that this will happen in due course, as your diligence is one of your positive attributes that I admire. Alright Alfred, I'll make it happen. Alrighty, I'll end the episode here. Now, I gotta let you know that for some reason I do monetize my videos, but these ads don't show up on my videos. And it probably is just because of what I watch on YouTube or my political point of views. Maybe I'm a single father in North Idaho. You know, that may have something to do with it. It also may just be that I have, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. It's just too bad there's so much drama concerning the world today, especially with the politics and all of that. But as everyone knows, those who seek liberty are always going to be oppressed by those who seek security. It's just the way of the beast, I guess. Anyways, whether I get money or not is not really what drives me to make these videos. I just enjoy making and telling the stories. So I might set up like a Patreon soon or something and if anybody wants to donate that'd be cool but i'm going to continue to make them irregardless of whether i make money or not so all i really wish from the audience is to just watch it give me a thumbs up maybe maybe just tell me that you like it or write a comment on why you don't like it and then that way i can just get better because you know what people lose when it comes to the money is the fact that I'm just telling a story. Whether it be a true story or not a true story, it doesn't matter. It's just the art of the storytelling is more than enough enjoyment for me. Anyways, this has been this episode, so I can't wait to make further episodes, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.